quite, um, quite frankly, I wasn't able to title it, so I will just say what I have in my mind, and then you can decide uh, what to call it. I gave it a tentative title, uh, The State of the Future. Actually, why I did that was I was frankly stumped at the time I got the invitation and I had no idea what to say, so I decided to use the title that was as ambiguous as possible. That would enable me to say whatever I wanted to say and still sound intelligent. So I hope we will get on well with this. I want to start with a story that I think most of us are familiar with is the six blind men of Hindustan, or the six blind men and the elephant. It's a story from the Indian subcontinent. It's about uh, six blind men that encounter an elephant. And so one of the blind men uh, grips the tail and says, This must be a rope. Uh, another grips the ear and says, This must be a fan. And uh, one of them holds the, uh, the leg, one of the legs, and says, This must be a tree. And so on and so forth it goes. And uh, the six blind men all define this creature differently. None of them actually arrive at the conclusion that they are dealing with a living creature or even an elephant. And so um, it is an interesting story that it ends in this court. One version ends in them actually having a violent confrontation over whose definition or whose description is correct. And I like that story because I think it's an apt um, parable for our times. I think we live in times of discord. And a lot of the conflict in our times is actually driven by the sort of dynamic you see in that parable. It's a conflict over narratives, a conflict over whose uh, uh, definition of reality is, is, is correct or superior to the other. It is um, a conflict of competing narratives, perspectives, paradigms, definitions, and descriptions. These are the things that drive discord and conflicts that we see in our world today, whether across ethnic lines or religious lines or racial lines. And if we take um, our country, for example, which is a very plural society, a very diverse society, like most diverse societies, Nigeria struggles with uh, meaning. We have competing narratives. Nigeria means different things to different people. Uh, naturally, if you have 250 languages or 300 languages, you will tend to have a lot of uh, diverse interpretations of reality, diverse interpretations of what Nigeria is, of what our reality is. And so frequently you find that the challenge in plural societies is these competing uh, paradigms, competing definitions of history, competing understandings or comprehensions of the past, the present, and the future. So in a sense, we are all living in that parable. We are all living in the story of the six blind men and the elephants. Except that in our instance, the elephant figuratively represents history, Figuratively represents reality. And so frequently you find that we are really exchanging brickbats over whose interpretation of reality is correct. And we express these interpretations either through ideology or religion or identity or nationalism or any other uh, argument, really, any other polemical uh, mainframe that suits us. Now, I'm going to, what I want to do really is to highlight some of the themes that struck me as I went back to look at that story. And uh, the first one is uh, humility. I thought to myself, from the first time I heard about that story, I thought it was a very funny story. I thought that the solution to the problem there, the mystery of the elephant, was fairly simple. And I thought that what should have happened was that the six blind men should have all rotated and interchanged position, and everybody should have felt what everybody else was feeling, and eventually they would come to the realization that our perspectives are actually limited, and since one person has held all the other parts encountered by the other person, they get a fuller picture of reality, and they come to discover that, okay, what we're actually touching here is an elephant. Uh, but in no version, and this story has multiple versions, in no version of the story will that even occur to any of the blind men. So in a sense, it's also a tragic story. Now, humility demands of us that we recognize that however accurate we believe our definitions of reality to be, however convinced we are about the veracity of our own interpretation of history or reality or life, we have to understand that ultimately our perspectives are limited perspectives. We have to be humble enough to realize that however fantastic our philosophy is, it is a limited one. We are limited by our vantage point, and that's one of the morals of that story. When we think about Nigeria, when we think about the world at large, 
what you're looking at really is competing narratives, but each of those narratives in their own way might be slightly right and slightly wrong. Not so much wrong, perhaps, as incomplete. We cannot have a full picture until we integrate all the other perspectives and harmonize them. And this to me is a challenge of understanding history in a plural country, understanding history in a diverse country. It is that we won't be able to harmonize the multiplicity of narratives and perspectives. You will not understand the civil war by reading one book on the civil war. You are not going to understand one conflict, any conflict actually, by reading just one account. A conflict has several multiple sides. That's, that is the way life is, that is the way a nation is. A nation is always a contestation of meaning, identity, narrative, geographical space, and just memory. So people look at Nigerian history and see different things. People see the history of the world, the history of the Middle East, the history of our region, and see different things. People can look at the same account and reach different conclusions. The idea is to realize, and this is where humility comes in, to realize that however convinced I am of my own perspective, it is ultimately a limited perspective. I am limited by my vantage point. My point of view limits me. And in order for us to reach a state of understanding, or even a state where dialogue is even possible, we need to be willing to abandon our own vantage points temporarily and move to the vantage point of our co-contestants. And once you do that, you begin to understand why other people see history the way they do. And even if you are not fully convinced, what it does is that another perspective ultimately enriches your own. The thing is that we are trapped, in a sense, by our own vantage point. We are trapped by our own points of view. And what's in the same way that I am trapped in this circle and every instinct in my body is actually crying out for me to move around the same because that makes me uncomfortable. But we are trapped in this enclosure, this paradigm, this narrative that we define for ourselves. And the challenge is for us to transcend the boundaries of our preferred narratives in order to gain a fuller understanding of reality. The second thing that comes to mind is the one I've just mentioned, the need for self-transcendence. The best way to think of this is to imagine that all our religions, all our philosophies, all our arguments are actually pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. So however profound we believe them to be, all you have is a piece. And to gain a full picture, a full portrait of reality, you need to integrate your piece with another person's piece. This is, in a sense, how we do this is by putting ourselves in the other person's shoes. A very nice school of saying it is empathy. Okay? Empathy is the ability to put yourself in the other person's shoes, to see the world through his or her eyes, to feel the world through his or her own senses, is the ability to build bridges across divides. So I have to, in a sense, understand your own story blend it with my own if I am to gain a full picture of reality, whatever that reality may be. If we are discussing Nigerian history, then we need to understand how the various component communities of this country understand Nigeria. Your own narrative, however justified, you may feel in your sense of brilliance or entitlement, is ultimately incomplete. Because Nigeria will not be transformed by one narrative. It will be transformed by the harmonization of multiple perspectives, multiple narratives. And the world will be transformed by that understanding that we need to understand each other's stories. And this to me, really, is one way of defining education. A real education, a proper education fit for the 21st century, is one that acquaints us with stories beyond the borders of our own experience is one that makes us understand what the other person is going through, how the other person interprets reality. It's one that enables us to see history not just through our own eyes, but through the eyes of other people. So for example, when you look at some of the most intractable conflicts in the world today, what you're looking at, as I said earlier, is essentially a context of narratives. So you ask yourself, will it ever be possible for Israelis to understand how Palestinians see this conflict, or for Palestinians to understand how Israelis see this conflict. I'm not saying that we have to agree. I'm saying, will they ever understand? Understanding of not necessarily have to read agreements. It just gives you an enriched perspective. Is it possible, for example, that if 
white police officers in the U.S. knew what it meant to grow up as an African-American male in the inner city. Racial relations in the United States would improve. Is it possible that um, if South Africans, or rather I should say, if Nigerians understood what it meant to come out of a century of slavery, political, psychological, and economic marginalization, that they would be more, perhaps, tolerant of the difficulties facing South Africa, the country we like to refer to as our younger brother, instead of being uh, judgmental, as quite frankly some of us have been in recent times. All of this is simply a question of understanding narratives, it's about understanding where other people are coming from. And this to me is what it means to be educated. To be educated is to be fluent in the interpretation of reality of other people. To be fluent in it. Whether you agree with it or not is not the issue. Is that you are fluent in it, is that you understand where the other people are coming from. And I think that this is very important for us today because Nigeria, for example, is home to two of the world's most assertive monotheistic faiths. And we live in an era that several scholars insist is defined by the clash of civilizations. I do not agree with that, but I'll come to that later. So the challenge for us, quite frankly, is one of empathy. Empathy is the critical skill of the 21st century. Empathy is the skill that sustains civilizations, is the skill that builds nations, especially when you are dealing with plural societies. And as we know, uh, for the last 50 or 100 years, let us say, Whenever we talk about things like ethnic discord, sectarian violence, the challenge of building homogeneous societies, usually the literature from the experts immediately zeroes in on Africa because Africa is supposed to be synonymous with tribal warfare, um, activistic, ethnic, um, clannishness, and that sort of thing. But today's news shows us clearly that European countries are dealing with the challenges of diversity. So today we hear about things like the failure of multiculturalism, among other things. So this is the universal challenge. The third idea I would like to bring forth is the one called Ubuntu. We lead naturally from that, uh, from the subject of empathy, to that of Ubuntu. It's a Bantu concept and it simply means I am because we are. And what it means is that the individual does not exist outside of the collective. It is an, a very African humanist argument for shared humanity, for seeing ourselves through the frames of shared humanity. The reason why it is important for us to understand each other's stories, each other's perspectives, understand each other's insecurities, is that we, when we have that, we are able to humanize each other. Throughout history, every incident of ethnic cleansing or genocide has been preceded by the dehumanization and the demonization of specific groups through myth, innuendo, uh, superstition, and stereotypes. Those things only exist in the vacuum created by ignorance. If we are more educated about each other, then we dispel the myths that tell us that people, certain people of a certain ethnic group or race or religion are a certain way, and we move on to a more complex understanding of a complex world in which we live in. The fourth idea I would like to advance, and this is in closing, is I said earlier that it is said that we live in the age of the clash of civilizations, where the East is fighting the West, or you have an Islamic East against the Christian West. These categories are very, very subjective. They are very, very generalized, and quite frankly, they are very, very inaccurate as well. The world is a lot more complex than binary thinking brings us to the moon. Uh, as a skeptic, I'm highly skeptical of binary thinking. Wherever black is called the means white for any event, is defined as two categories fighting themselves. I immediately become skeptical because I think the world is a bit more complex than that. I do not believe that we are, that this world is now defined by clash of civilizations. I think that the defining, dividing line of the world today is between empaths and psychopaths. And psychopaths can be created by any religion, any ideology, and any political system, just like empaths can be created. So I believe that we need to now begin to strengthen the forces of empathy in our society. And with that understanding, defeat the forces of psychopathy as told by the various extremist groups that we see today in our world. Thank you.